This is GB News, Britain's news channel. As Iran attacks Israel, I ask the question, how did the West get it so wrong over Iran? And what's the wise thing for Israel to do next? We broadcast tonight the first exclusive TV interview with Liz Truss about her book, which is being published tomorrow, and I promise you, she doesn't hold back. And as we speak, a game of parliamentary ping pong is going on in the House of Commons. They are fighting back against rejected amendments that have come from the House of Lords. But I ask the question, does any of it in the end really matter? But before all of that, let's get the news with Polly Middlehurst. Nigel, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story tonight from the GB newsroom is that the Prime Minister says he's going to be urging his Israeli counterpart to show restraint following Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel. Rishi Sunak told the Commons that he'll be speaking to Benjamin Netanyahu later on today to both reiterate the UK's solidarity with Israel but also to discuss how to prevent an escalation of violence in the region. There was condemnation of Iran's military offensive against Israel from both Sakir Starmer and Rishi Sunak today. Our aim is to support stability and security because it is right for the region and because, although the Middle East is thousands of miles away, it has a direct effect on our security and prosperity at home. There can be no doubt that the attack perpetrated by Iranian forces this weekend has left the world a more dangerous place. It targeted innocent civilians with a clear intent to destabilise the region. It must be wholly condemned by all. Sir Keir Starmer speaking earlier on today. Now, in other news, 534 migrants were intercepted while crossing the English Channel yesterday. That makes it the highest number of crossings on a single day so far this year. And it means the number of small boat arrivals this year now stands at a provisional total of 6,265. It comes as the government's flagship Rwanda policy returns to Parliament. As you heard, with MPs debating the latest amendments by peers this evening. A judge ordered today that Prince Harry must pay 90% of Home Office legal costs after losing a case over his personal security. The Duke of Sussex had argued the court should reduce the amount he was required to pay by more than half. He launched legal action against the Home Office for cutting his police protection after he stopped being a full-time working member of the royal family. And in the United States, Donald Trump has lost a second bid to remove the judge in his so-called hush money criminal trial. He claimed the presiding judge had a conflict of interest because his daughter worked for a political consulting firm with links to the Democratic Party. The former US president has been charged in connection with a case involving a payment to an adult film star. Arriving in court a little earlier on today, he described the start of the trial as an assault on America. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. Here at home, a suspected tornado has ripped through a Staffordshire village today. Roof tiles were dislodged, windows were smashed by flying debris and vehicles damaged as well as the area experienced gale force winds near Stoke-on-Trent. It happened early on this morning, affecting several houses with roads closed off by Staffordshire Fire and Rescue as it worked to make homes safe. Unpredictable April weather we're having. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good evening. Thus far, it has been a proxy war. It has been the proxies of Iran. Uh, those terrorist groups, three of them that I can think of, that have been launching the attacks against Israel and indeed against Western shipping as well. But last night, and bear in mind that this extreme Islamist regime have been in charge since 1979, they have as a very clear objective that Israel should be completely 
wiped out, launched their first ever attack on Israel. Something like 350 drones, cruise missiles and rockets were fired at Israel. 95% of them were intercepted and shot down, including some action by our own Royal Air Force. But the question I'm very keen to ask is, how did the West get this so wrong? We have been appeasing Iran ever since the JCPOA deal, as it's known. And this was the deal that President Obama put together with, of course, Joe Biden as the vice president, supported enthusiastically by the European Union and indeed by the British government. And the idea was we remove sanctions, we free up tens of billions of dollars of frozen money, and in return, Iran will not continue to build a nuclear weapon. And what have they done with that money? Well, it has helped them, of course, to fund Hamas. It's helped them to fund Hezbollah. It's helped them to fund the Houthis, and it directly helped them to fund the rocket attacks on Israel last night. We have got this wrong at every level. I have been against this deal from day one. I was delighted when Trump was president in America, that he pulled the Americans out of it. But you would have thought, wouldn't you, after that response last night, that the West might have learned its lesson. But oh no, unbelievably, the European Union High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Vice President of the European Commission, Joseph Burrell, said overnight he had spoken with the Iranian Foreign Minister late on Sunday. He said the EU needed to have the best possible relations with Iran. So that's OK, Iran. Just keep firing more rockets. The European Union don't mind. And what of the response from America? I mean, this is truly incredible. President Biden, his message to Israel is, you got a win. Take the win. And that was followed up by our own Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, who quoted, as Biden said, take the win and move on. So basically, Israel is not allowed to respond in any way at all. They've just got to take it. And the European Union will go on supplying industrial parts that are being put into drones and rockets being used by the Iranian regime. Oh, and by the way, being sent to the Russians as well. How do we get into this mess with Iran? I'll tell you. After 21 years in the European Parliament, I've seen how global politics works. It is the influence of big global business. They are the ones that have the influence over governments and the decisions that they take. I promise you I'm right about this. If you think I'm wrong, well, you let me know. Farage at GBNews. Com. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio on this difficult day by Zippy Hotavelli, Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom. Thank you for coming in. Hello, Nigel. So, according to Joe Biden and our foreign secretary, it was a good night for Israel. You got a win. It was a bad night for Iran because Iran uh, launched massive attack on Israel with, uh, as you mentioned, over 300 missiles, yeah. including uh, those drones that we've seen operating in Ukraine, same footprint same of drones. Iran. And uh, in the end of the game, it ended with a major failure to the Iranians and with a creation of a wonderful coalition, including Israel, United States, United Kingdom. It's a good opportunity to, to thank your Royal Air Force and um, actually to your government also by leading this and understanding that this is a front that uh, must be confronted together and uh, also with moderate Arab countries that were for, on our side. So together, yeah. I believe this coalition um, is now creating a uh, a message to Iran. Not I'm having, saying, not having I'm saying, thousands killed is not a win, is it? No, 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 absolutely not. I said it's a failure to Iran, but we don't see it as a win. No. We see it as uh, performing of our technological abilities, of the fact that Israel can mm. fight and Israel can create coalitions. Israel is not alone in the world. But and I think this is the most important thing. One thing we have learned from the 7th of October, um, by again mentioning Hamas as a proxy of Iran, you should always look at your enemy's intentions, not whether he killed people, whether he managed to achieve um, uh, the big things he wanted to achieve by targeting our military bases. Iran's attempt was to kill. Iran's attempt was to hurt. Iran's attempt was 
to attack a sovereign country from its own border, from its own soil. For the first time. For the first time. And since the, the first um, Gulf War, Israel was not attacked from another sovereign country. This is unprecedented. And the fact that Iran had the nerve to do it means not enough deterrence. And the game now is deterrence. Yeah. And no one is expecting Israel. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the people. I'm surrounded with British people that heard from the head of MI5 last year, Iran is a threat to this country as much as it's a threat to Israel. So Iran was targeting individuals in your country. Uh, and last year, uh, it was the head of MI5 saying that. And all mm. the government leaders know that. No, I think the good news. And, 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 and what, just, just to make it clear, Israel is not being expected just to sit and do nothing when 300 um, weapons are fired well, on our cities. Well, that's the extraordinary thing, though, isn't it? I mean, look, I think there is good news here in that the focus of the debate now is back on Iran. Right. And people can very clearly see who the bad the guys are. The head of are. the snake. Like, absolutely, and who is funding all the different all the different proxies out there. And, you know, for the general public to understand proxy wars, you know, they're busy leading their lives. This makes it much yes. simpler. This lion been hiding, uh, as I told yeah. you, behind this bush of proxies, but n not anymore. Absolutely. So and, and, and the other sensible Arab states have been very much on your side, um, overnight allowing their airspace to be used to shoot down rockets, etc. And maybe that's the good thing. But the incredible thing here is, and we've had, you know, in the last hour or so, the IDF Chief of Staff, uh, Lieutenant General um, Halevi, saying that the drone attack for, uh, will be met with a response, doesn't say how or when. The incredible thing I put to you is that actually what Joe Biden is saying and what David Cameron is saying is you mustn't respond at all. You must just accept it and take it, otherwise there will be escalation. Israel does have a right to respond. It's said it is going to respond. The question is, Ambassador, what would the intelligent response be? So let's start with what is under my portfolio as a diplomat. Sure. There is some things, the War Cabinet will make decisions, and the people of Israel are expecting very much to make sure that they will be protected from this type of attacks. No country in the world can tolerate this type of, of attacks. If we would have seen Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool and London attacked at the same night with drones, mm. I'm sure your Prime Minister wasn't happy and wasn't saying, OK, we just managed to... No, but, but that's to, what they're uh, telling you. Yeah, exactly. So this is not the case, and we definitely need to create better deterrence. Um, um, deterrence for Iran. And another thing, one thing that the UK knows from any other country in the world better is that sometimes not operating, not acting against aggressor, create a bigger escalation. And I'm speaking about exactly the same thing you were saying, the appeasement. You cannot appease. Our long-standing approach from a diplomatic point of view is to proscribe the IRGC. The Iranian re uh, Revolutionary Guard are still definitely hasn't done. operating as a, as a massive terror organization, mm. the head of the octopus, uh, sending its arms all over the Middle East, destabilizing all the region, uh, sponsoring those horrific terror tunnels of Hamas, where we have 130 hostages still there being violated, women being raped on a daily basis, and they're not releasing them. They're not willing to release so all of them. should the British government act? I think, first of all, it's for me to speak on behalf of the Israeli government. The Israeli government is responsible to act because we must make sure that Iran won't do that again. And if we let her go and let her, you know, just uh, say... It's not a big deal, 300 drones and missiles. It's a very big deal. It's a massive attack, and no one, no one can really expect I, Israel I, to I do just nothing. Feel, I just feel that Biden and Cameron are being rather condescending towards Israel. As an ambassador, I wouldn't expect you to respond to that comment. No, I think actually we have we have a very close partnership with the UK, and I'm actually thanking the leadership of the government in this country for understanding the threat of Iran. And actually, we've been working very closely, including on an intelligence level, and the way the UK was operating about the Iran issue with the Americans was actually a robust uh, point of view of understanding the, the, the big threat. They understand it's a threat to London as much as it's a threat mm. on Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Ambassador Hutabelli, thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed. Well, I'm now joined down the line by Sir Richard Dalton, the former British ambassador to Iran. Uh, Sir Richard, uh, I put it to you that the policy of appeasement uh, started, led by Obama, backed, it seems, still today, by the European Union, and indeed with the British government, has, as the events of last night show, been a total and utter failure. There's been no policy of appeasement whatsoever. You're entirely wrong about that. 
British relationships with Iran are at absolute zero. We've not been able to trade or finance any normal dealings with Iran since the 2016 implementation of the nuclear agreement. Uh, you are exaggerating grossly and misleading your viewers about what British policy and American policy has been. Now, we need to think a little bit more about that nuclear agreement, because if you're not prepared to attack, invade, and totally destroy the government of a country, then you have to influence their policy by other means. Those other means were used over decades, namely sanctions and isolation. We retained a dialogue over the nuclear program because of its potential danger. And that led to the most comprehensive and effective nuclear de-escalation agreement that has ever been achieved with any country, with any potentially threshold country. That was the British interest. That was the European interest. That was the American interest. That was the Israeli interest. And we were comprehensively screwed by President Trump, who pulled out of it thereby leaving Iran free of the restrictions and the monitoring which that agreement had laid upon them. All Since the evidence then, is, course, American, all the evidence is, all the evidence is that Iran, is that Iran ignored it. Iran ignored it. Maximum pressure sanctions, which are not appeasement. It's why Iran has been driven into the arms of Russia and China. China takes their oil, and they have a weapons arrangement now with Russia. That would not have happened if our American allies had acted in their own Israel and the UK's interest. All the evidence is that Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon than it was at the time of this agreement. And it's all well and good signing up for nuclear de-escalation if the partner on the other side obeys the rules. The evidence, surely, Sir Richard, is the Iranians ignored it and a lot of frozen assets were freed up and they have used those assets to fund their terrorist proxies around the region. The policy was a failure. You're absolutely wrong. The people who were observing the agreement from 2016 to 2019 were the Iranians. That is established truth by the International Atomic Agency, by the Americans, by ourselves. It was the UK and its European partners under the leadership of America who made it impossible for Iran to carry on fulfilling the agreement because we trashed it. The Americans led the way, and because of the dominance of the Americans in the world economy, Britain and its European partners were unable to fulfill their obligations to Iran. So naturally enough, after a year's delay in the hope that we would be able to stand up to the Americans, we failed to do that because we, in most of our foreign policies towards the Middle East, were just a lickspittle of the Americans. And after a year's delay, Iran started slowly breaching the agreement. And yes, they are now possessing significant quantities that could be turned into highly enriched uranium quite quickly. And that's the fault of the partners of Iran in that deal. And here we are with um, drones being sent uh, into Israel, uh, the same drones being used by the Russians that contain parts manufactured by uh, British-owned companies, uh, European Union companies. Uh, we're not coming out of this very well, are we? Yes, I think we have come out of it well. You're entirely wrong to ignore the context in which the Iranian retaliation took place. You're typical of British politicians who think the present and the future starts today. It doesn't. It started with a decades-long shadow war between Israel and Iran, in which the hits were taken by Iran, and they were soaked up. Whether it was Iranian, whether it was Israeli sabotage, Israeli assassinations, all on sovereign Iranian territory, whether it was the degrading of military capabilities which Iran had in Syria, the offensive was in the hands of Israel. 
And uh, the uh, Iranians exercised what they call strategic patience in what Israel calls the war between the wars. But when on April the 1st, the Israelis conducted an unlawful and unwise attack on Iranian consular premises in Damascus, they tipped over the table. They broke the China and they put Iran, probably deliberately from the point of view of the Israeli war cabinet, into a corner, knowing that Iran would have to retaliate. Now, in my opinion, it was wrong of Iran to retaliate on Israeli sovereign territory because of the risk of a regional war. But the other issue that I would beg you to consider is whether it's in anybody's interest for there to be a regional war. If you encourage Israel to retaliate now against the advice of President Biden, the advice of the British government, mm. the advice of the European Union, you are partly responsible for a regional conflagration which is going to savage the well, world economy and seriously impact well, British so Richard, security I, interests. I think this needs a very considered and clever response from Israel. I, I am absolutely there on that. Um, one thing I won't be doing is taking foreign policy advice from Joe Biden. But, Sir Richard, thank you for joining us and giving us your view of that agreement over the course of the last decade. Now, let's think military for a moment. I'm joined by Chris Parry, former Royal Navy commander, who joins me from Portsmouth. Where else? Um, Chris, um, the Royal Air Force involved last night, sort of backing up the Americans, I think, in shooting down drones and missiles. How much do we actually know? Before I answer that, um, I was just listening to the previous speaker, and I've just read a book on the period leading up to 1939. And our yeah. ambassador in Berlin had similar delusions about the Germans. <laughs> uh, well, um, Chris, you know, the, the thing about GB News is I've given some very strong opinions at the top of this show. We do allow other opinions and we yeah. treat our viewers. We, we, we think our viewers are big enough and ugly enough to make up their own minds, but I'm absolutely with you. Because it's ironic when he said, you know, the future concerns the past, uh, uh, you know, and the present. Um, it seems to me that the uh, Foreign Office hasn't been thinking about the past in anything to do with Iran. Uh, and I have to say, some of the factual information there is at odds with what I think has happened. But there mm. we go. Anyway, let's get back to uh, yeah. Royal Men's stuff. Um, yeah. OK, yeah, the Royal Air Force, fantastic, uh, has taken part with the Israelis and the Americans in a very complicated defence package. And I think what was interesting about what the Israeli ambassador said is the intent was to hurt Israel. It doesn't matter... Mm you know, what happens in the end. The intent was to put 330 missiles and drones onto Israel, most of it into urban areas. The fact that the Israelis ourselves and the Americans were competent in shooting them down is irrelevant. That was designed to be a major hit, uh, yes. uh, and it, it didn't work. Yeah, no, absolutely. So what happens next, Chris? We just stay there and we intervene again if Iran tries again? I think the smart move, uh, Nigel, is for Israel to say, you know what, we owe you one and we're going to hold you at risk. And we're going to, at some stage in the future, if you really misbehave, we're going to wallop you. Um, but I think it won't be smart to retaliate at the moment. I think the Iranians have got to never know the time and place at which it's going to happen. That way you stabilise, uh, you act as a restraining influence. In the meantime, you get on with Gaza, you get on with dealing with the Houthis, yeah. and at some stage, I think, Hezbollah as well. Otherwise, poor old Israel is going to be an armed camp for the next uh, 10 years or so. Um, so I think what you do is um, you put the snake to one side at the moment and you deal with the little snakes uh, first uh, and uh, then see what appetite Iran's got. I think there's a race against time. Uh, because I think the Iranians have been working on their nuclear program. How naive was that? Um, mm. And uh, they will get it around 25, 26. And uh, if you remember, Nigel, the JCPOA said they could have it uh, in 2025. That was part the of the whole, deal. Chris, the yeah. whole thing is utterly bonkers. Yeah. I agree with you entirely. Thank you once again for joining us on the programme. Well, some very spirited debate in that first segment. In a moment, Liz Truss's first TV interview about her new book, and I promise you, she does not hold back.
I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3 p.m. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges, proposals tabled by the local Green Party or passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight. And the charges could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris. Now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022 that said... Um, Real world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalize the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's Liz Truss's book launch tomorrow. The only Conservative in the room is what she says she was very often, particularly on the international stage, and quite often, I think, within her own party. At least that's how she felt. Now, she's done a series of interviews. This is her first interview with a live UK TV channel. Let's begin with that theme of the only Conservative in the room. Already causing a bit of a row, perhaps unsurprisingly, the book uh, that I'm talking about is Liz Truss's 10 Years to Save the West, Lessons from the Only Conservative in the Room. Well, the only Conservative in the Room joins me now. Liz Truss, quite extraordinary, after 14 years of Conservative government, and you were there for a decade and more, holding very senior Cabinet positions, is this by the end of the process, that you were the only Conservative in the room. Was that the case from the very beginning? Well, the only Conservative in the room refers to the position of the UK in the global firmament. And what I faced was Emmanuel Macron in France, yep. Olaf Scholz in Germany, Biden in the US, Trudeau in Canada. And the fact is that the free world has been largely run by the left, with the exception of the UK, I was the only Conservative in the room, yeah. for many years. And it's not working. You know, the West is weak. Uh, we're seeing authoritarian regimes on the, on the rise. And what we're also seeing is in our own societies, our very values being undermined. You know, the things we believe in, our nation, the family, individual freedom, all of those core values are being undermined. And that is what my book is about. Do you, I mean, as we, you know, we're in an election year, 
Do you actually regard the current Conservative Party as being Conservative? Well, I'd like them to be more Conservative. Mm. They're definitely more Conservative than the, Labour, than the Labour Party, which are desperate to kowtow to the global left, desperate to give in to the eco-extremists, desperate to have more immigration into Britain. But I would like to see the Conservative Party taking a stronger stance, mm. and in particular, being prepared to change the system. Because what I found as a minister and as prime minister, that too often, much of the power that was meant to lie in our hands actually lied, lay with unelected bureaucrats, and it became impossible to get things done. So. I want to see a Conservative yeah. party that's actually prepared to challenge the status quo, prepared to challenge the system, in order to deliver the Conservative policies that, you know, I want to see. You see, you mentioned all those things about why Labour would be worse. Migration under a Conservative government running at record levels. You know, nearly, nearly three quarters of a million in just one year alone. Um, climate alarmism, it was Boris Johnson. And Theresa May, in fact, that started putting us on to a net zero agenda, uh, which is completely unattainable. Already the 2030 goal for no new petrol and diesel cars has slipped to 2035. And in terms of constitutional reform and change, a Conservative Party at its centre that fought Brexit, didn't want Brexit to happen, and then really struggled to deliver it. I mean, really the point I'm making is that do you right now, do you really see at the centre and the leadership, not necessarily the members. You know, you, you know, your members in your constituency in Norfolk, I'm sure, are still pretty conservative. They're very, very no, conservative. I'm, I'm, they no, are I, I even extremely read, conservative. I even read in the book that a lot, a lot of them think Donald Trump's a good guy. They do. Yeah, they do. Um, which is unlike what we get in Number Ten and Number Eleven Downing Street today. Do we actually, right now, have a big fundamental philosophical difference between the Conservative leadership and the Labour leadership? I mean, you, you talked about things like net zero, you talked mm. about immigration. Mm. But let, let's remember where those policies started. It was the Labour government under Blair that put in place the Climate Change Act. Yep. We're struggling to deal with illegal immigration because of the Human Rights Act, mm -hmm. which brought the ECHR into UK law, Human but also, Act, yeah. also the Constitutional Reform Act which Blair put in in 2005, which created the Supreme Court, which we never had before in Britain, which is now challenging government policy. So I would say what we have got wrong over the last 14 mm. years is we didn't take on that Blair consensus. And now, when we're trying to deliver things like Rwanda, the problem is that we are hidebound by the Blairite legacy, which has essentially tied us up in knots. It's also meant that a lot of decisions that should be taken by ministers are effectively being taken by the courts. You know, they're being taken by unelected bureaucrats. So I would argue the problems started earlier on. Yeah, in 2010, they started when, I, I when people with that. said, you know, Tony Blair is the master, mm. you know, w w I'm the heir to Blair. That was where the problems started. And now, yeah. you know, 14 years later, we didn't do enough to but turn that round. That's not to say, by the way, that you know we've achieved nothing. We haven't. We have achieved you know, Brexit as a major achievement. Reluctantly, but it's been done. Just we, about we we got out of we got out of the European Union. We've delivered huge amounts of trade deals. We've joined the CPTPP. We've delivered big education reform. The school results in England are a lot better now than the school results mm. in Scotland on the SNP. So it's not to say we've had no achievements, but I think and what my book says is we should have done more yeah. to take on well, the Blair consensus. No, no, and and we'll, that is at the heart of the problems we well, we'll now face. And by the way, you know, Keir Starmer just wants to double down on that stuff. Mm. He wants to outsource even more power. He wants to listen yeah, to international but the, courts. But the even argument more. the other lot are worse isn't very powerful, is it? Well, this is why I believe we need to acknowledge what the problems are and actually say how we're going to deal with them from, from a position of principle. It's also easy to forget that Liz Truss voted Remain. She now appears to be an ardent Brexiteer. I asked her about that conversion. A bandwidth. It dominated everything, didn't it? I mean, Cameron resigns the next morning. We finish up with Theresa May. God knows how, as Prime Minister. 
that appears to be. Well, I explain how in my book. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, it, in fact, that, that part of the story is, is slightly bizarre. But we then go through parliamentary deadlock, where it isn't just the Speaker that doesn't want Brexit really to happen. It isn't just the Labour Party, or most of it. Actually, the Conservative Party just don't believe in it, do they? I don't think that is true or fair. I think there is a divide in the Conservative Party mm. between those people, and I'm very much one of them, who want to go for the Singapore on steroids approach. Yeah. You know, given that we've decided to leave the European Union, the consequence of that is we need to become more dynamic, more nimble, more competitive. We need to get rid of all the EU laws straight away. We need to get on with doing trade deals with our allies. We've made a decision. And we need, yeah. We've made a decision, yeah. Yeah. and you know, that has huge consequences. So we've had a white hall that's been shaped by being in Europe. You know, essentially supplicants to Europe. And it's almost like, what is that syndrome when you become a hostage and you start to love Stockholm. your... Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. It's almost like that. You know, mm. Officials were constantly looking to Brussels for validation. And it, all of that needed to change. But it was also, and, wasn't it treated, really... Didn't the Conservative Party look at it and say this is a damage limitation exercise as opposed to a big opportunity? Well, so some people did. That is certainly true. They so that is certainly true of the sort of Philip Hammonds of this world and the Treasury. Mm. Uh, and I was in there pretty much straight up or well, quite close to after referendum. They absolutely saw it at that. And there were other people in the Conservative Party of that view. I'd call them the Conservative Party establishment mm. were of that view. But there were certainly others who wanted to embrace yeah. the opportunities in the Conservative Party. So the Conservative Party has been divided as to how to approach well, this actually... issue. And I just thought, you know, I'm, I'm a logical person. I thought the logic of Brexit is you yeah. have to do things differently. What is the point of leaving the European Union if you've still got all the laws on the statute books? And just... No, I agree with that. But in some ways, what this book shows also is that those divides within the Conservative Party don't exist just on Brexit. They exist on virtually everything. There are two distinctly different wings of the current Conservative Party. We're told it's a broad church, but it strikes me that right now it's a broad church without faith. Well, I believe there is a you know, clear Conservative faith and set of policies, and I've talked about what they are, mm -hmm. being proud of our nation state. Yeah low taxes and small government. But that's your uh, position. You know, but the, but, but 14... that is what I think the Conservative Party should and has been most successful when it represents but, that but, position. But, but not and for that's the last 14 what, years. That's what I think the public want as well. But the last 14 years, they've not done those things. Well, we have not done enough to reverse the Blair legacy, which has created yeah. this... You know, has anyone tried? I've tried. Well, we're Believe gonna, me, well, we're going to come I've to had, that. You Don't know, worry. I, I've been at the coal face we, we, we trying, are, we, and, and I think one of the one of the things that my book is talking about is how, as I went through the system, because yeah. I was a believer in the system. When I got into government, I felt that as a minister, I could change things, and over time, hmm. I realised that actually, in order to be able to really change things in the way Britain needs and wants, and that's what the public's desire is. There needs to be a serious change to the whole framework and structure of government. It's, we simply aren't able to deliver those Conservative policies. And for this segment, one last little thing. I asked her about the creation and the power of the Supreme Court. Or the highest court in Milan were the Law Lords within the Palace of Westminster. And Blair sets up a Supreme Court. Should we stick with the Supreme Court? No, we should abolish it. Should we? We should abolish it. Um, and the other important change, and I didn't fully appreciate how dramatic this change had been until I became Lord Chancellor. Mm. But previously, the Lord Chancellor was appointed by the Prime Minister, sat in Cabinet, and was responsible <coughs> for appointing senior judges. Yep. Now, who appoints the senior judges now? Well, there's a panel that does it, isn't there's, there? It's a quango. Yeah. It's the Judicial Appointments Commission. Yeah, yeah it's there. And what de facto happens is the judiciary have become a self-perpetuating oligarchy because the current Lord Chief Justice has a lot of say over who his or her successor is. Okay. So what we've done, or what Blair has done, is created a system 
that has undermined the core of the British Constitution, which is parliamentary sovereignty. That is the core of the British Constitution, the idea that ultimately these bodies are democratically accountable. What, what is being created is another series of quangos making decisions which are gradually, I think, moving away from the views of the public. Well, some very powerful arguments there from Liz Truss saying that power has gone away from Parliament and it's gone to the Supreme Court and it's gone to a variety of quangos. Well, John McTurnan was Tony Blair's <laughs> former director of political operations between 2005 and 2007. John, she does have a point there, doesn't she? Well, the main thing, the, the big turn that came across was it was always somebody else's fault. Liz Truss was in the Cabinet, eventually became Prime Minister, in the Cabinet for nine years. Tony was only in the Cabinet for ten uh, and yet Liz Truss was unable to do anything. It was always somebody else's fault. And I think the railing against Tony Blair um, tells you a lot about the politics, her political journey, you know, the only, <coughs> the only Liberal Democrat in the room at times. Uh, but the point she makes, John, come on, you know, it was Tony Blair who incorporated the ECHR into UK yeah. law via the Human Rights Act. It is that Human Rights Act that ultimately the Supreme Court now uh, can, can, can lean upon um, and override government so the, policy. So, the, in the end, all the Human Rights Act did was make faster the access uh, to the rights guaranteed under the ECHR. Um, what actually used to happen was, um, if you if you had a case and you had to take it the, to, to, to the ECHR, it could take you seven or eight or nine years. So mm. justice delayed, justice denied. Those rights are now accessible. We just to ignored you. it and carried on with life. No, they, they, what the uh, Treasury did was they said, let's keep appealing, keep appealing, keep appealing. We know we'll have to give in, but we'll do it for seven or eight years. And it could be for a small business person. It could be for uh, an individual uh, a pension over there. The, 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 the thing is, should everything in the country be subordinated to the cabinet, to the executive, the government, or should it be subordinated to parliament? Because it's not very clear to me whether Liz Truss is saying the problem with the Supreme Court is um, it's not part of parliament, <coughs> or the problem is that, I, I the, think, that the cabinet okay. members don't get to yeah. appoint. I, I, now, I, I, don't I think, think she is arguing parliament. I don't think cabinet members should, 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 should appoint I think judges. she is arguing she that parliament... She thinks parliament should appoint judges. Well, she's arguing very... that parliament's de been devalued by quite significant constitutional changes that Blair made. Our country's changed, absolutely. Devolution changed the country, and I think that's for that's good reason. That's, that's power dispersed. I actually think... That is it working? It, uh, it is working. Um, Not very well. People get... No, people, people have got to choose the governments they want. In Wales, it's always Labour. It's not, <laughs> it's not it's always nationalists at the moment. Um, Look, the, the, and the, the, I, think, I think Steve Rotherham, the Metro Mayor in Liverpool, is a really good example of somebody. I think Andy Street is too, being a voice of the, 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 the locality. Andy Burnham, you see it. But, the, but we come back to this. Mm. Um, the Labour Party put through some constitutional changes which reflected, uh, in the end, dispersal of power away from government, away from the executive, removed power from the, from, from the House of Lords, getting rid of the, of the, um, uh, the inherited peerage by and large. And... Dispersing power from away from Westminster is probably a good idea. Whereas it seems to me Liz Truss is saying the reason the Tory government is unable to achieve change is because it doesn't have enough power. Now, <coughs> well, you, you pointed out correctly, yeah. they do not have a coherent political project. Mm. Brexit wasn't even a coherent political project. Mm. Brexit was a response by David Cameron to a failure to agree about the future of Britain in Europe or outside Europe. The inability of the government to govern. I, uh, I often, I often uh, find myself uh, listening to Liz because I think she does try to make an argument for a different kind of conservatism. But I also then wonder about what about the detail? She says she likes Singapore on steroids. I'd love Britain to be like Singapore. Lee Kuan Yew, the great leader who took Singapore to, to, mm. to its current situation, he was the president of the Socialist International. Um, <laughs> so I think sometimes Liz needs to know her own history. <laughs> well, that she's saying we should be a socialist country, and Singapore's great the strength comes from being an make, entrepot for China. The one point she did make, John, that was logical, I think, in that interview, and, and, and I think unarguable, is that if the country's decided for Brexit, and the Parliament's ultimately, mm. after a bit of fiddling around for three years, mm. passed it. Mm. But once you've made that change, 
you then need to take advantage of it in every way you can. And we really haven't done that. And, and Labour show no signs of wanting to do that. I think, so I think the, I think the, the core of it is that in the end, the devil is in the detail. So for Liz, who was it that was actually stopping her inside the Treasury, inside the civil service, inside? It's always a nameless... Well, the government of the Bank of England I mean, does get named. I mean, yeah, the government... Is, and the idea that the Prime Minister should pick and choose who the government of the Bank of England is and sack them at whim and at will, um, when the Prime Minister was unsighted about a certain uh, consequence of her budget, well, she'd sacked, personally sacked, the permanent secretary of the Treasury, Scholar, yeah. Tom Scholar. It, it's the sort of, as I said at the beginning, it's like, it, it, when I was at the, it's never her fault. When I was at school, we, I went to a Scottish secondary school and nobody would ever take responsibility for any bad acts they did. And we thought, in the end, we decided that the, the school motto should be, it wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> and that sounds like that's the title right. for... John Baton, and some of these constitutional debates will go on for many, <laughs> many years. In a moment, we'll go to the House of Commons and find out what is happening in the game of parliamentary ping-pong on the Rwanda bill. I'll also ask, in the end, is it really going to make any difference? Hello again, welcome to the latest weather forecast from the Met Office. It's going to stay blustery over the next 24 hours, but less windy than it has been, and the showers will slowly ease as well. Low pressure is pulling away, it's moving east. We've got high pressure arriving later in the week, but for the time being, the weather stays very changeable with showers or longer spells of rain moving through during the evening. Many of these showers will actually fade away after midnight, although some will continue down the North Sea coast there, one or two for Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and central England, but otherwise plenty of drier and clearer weather emerging later in the night. A chill in the air first thing Tuesday, but too breezy for most for a frost. And there'll be plenty of bright weather first thing, especially for Scotland, Northern England, parts of Western UK. But further cloud and showers will affect the North Sea coast and showers will tend to bubble up elsewhere, particularly for Northern Ireland, parts of central and southern England, Wales and northwest Scotland. It's going to stay on the cold side, but temperatures a degree or so higher compared with Mondays and less windy, so a bit more pleasant out there. Another chilly start on Wednesday, but again, plenty of sunshine first thing, turning cloudy and damp for Northern Ireland, showers emerging elsewhere, but plenty of bright or at least drier weather in between the showers. And then as we go through the latter half of the week, things do slowly turn drier, more settled and warmer. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Let's go to the Palace of Westminster and speak to GB News' political editor, Christopher Hope, uh, where a game of parliamentary ping-pong is taking place. What is the latest, Chris? <laughs> 
Hi, Nigel, and great, great to see you. Yeah, that's right. Well, the, 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 the debate on the safety of Rwanda bill, which is trying to overturn um, seven amendments made by peers in the House of Lords, started at 7 p.m. Voting starts at 9 p.m. But Michael Tomlinson, who's the illegal migration minister, he started off by saying why the government opposes all of these changes. The reason why he gave is quite fascinating. He said that the problem is here we can't allow amendments that will provide loopholes for the, and could perpetuate the current cycle of delays and late legal challenges and to removal. So they, the government is very clear that these changes proposed by the House of Lords, some of which sound quite anodyne, things like uh, um, describing Rwanda as a safe country, have due regard for international law, Tempting Afghans who have worked alongside the British. Some of these things are seen as, oh, well, what's the problem here with the government? Why can't they get on with accepting them? Michael Tomlinson has made very clear if we accept this, it will allow another way for lawyers to frustrate the will of this government to get these flights taken off and, uh, and, and break this business model of these people, smugglers. So it's all about getting this through this week. Well, I fully expect um, the seven to be uh, over, overturned by MPs tonight. Back to the laws tomorrow and then back to the, we expect the laws to reinstate them tomorrow and back on Wednesday when I think the final denouement will take place. The laws will fold on Wednesday as the whips hope and by Thursday this will be law and then there will be a new battle, Nigel, in the courts. Uh, probably five or six weeks of lawyers trying to stop uh, flights taking off around, around 150 or so um, illegally arrived migrants will get letters from the Home Office saying you're on the first flight and that will be a new, a new fight but the law will be in place by Thursday as the government hope. And if the House of Lords doesn't fold on Wednesday and decides to stand firm in saying they oppose this legislation, what then? We are in uncharted territory. Now, I've, I heard from a senior peer on the Labour side. He said he thought that the government or Rishi Sunak could call an election if that happened. I don't think that's right. I think with, when your party is 25 points behind in the polls, they are waiting for something to turn that round. And one thing that might work is getting these first flights taking off. Don't forget, Labour policy, Nigel, is to re reverse it, to axe the whole Rwanda scheme, yeah. even if it's working. So the government wants to get as many flights taking off. But yeah, we are in, in uncharted territory. And I'm, I'm too old, I've gone too grey to start predicting the future too much in politics. No, and of course we've got to remember that over the course of the weekend, 750 arrived, so hey, this really matters. Chris Hope, thank you very much indeed. Donald Trump is in court today. It's about the payment of $130,000 of so-called hush money to Stormy Daniels, a payment made by Mr Trump's lawyer at the time. I'm joined by Mike Davis, former clerk to the United States Supreme Court and founder of conservative legal advocacy group Article 3 Project. Mike, um, Elon Musk has come out very publicly saying this is lawfare, uh, that the judge who's overseeing this case has been a donor to the Democrats and that this thing is highly politicised. Um, there's no argument about that. We can all see that from both sides of the pond. The question I want to ask you is, was this payment of $130,000 made to Stormy Daniels? And if it was, do you believe President Trump knew about it? Even if this payment were made to Stormy Daniels in 2016, this would be a settlement of a nuisance claim, which happens all the time in American business. And this payment from 2016, this alleged payment, is somehow tr being transformed from what is at best a bookkeeping misdemeanor under New York law into 34 felonies with a convoluted, I would say bogus legal theory that was passed over by the prior Manhattan District Attorney, the Manhattan U.S. Attorney, the Federal Election Commission, and Alvin Bragg himself until Matthew Colangelo got deployed from the Biden Justice Department, a very senior political appointee in the Biden Justice Department, to resurrect this zombie case against Trump during an election year. This is obviously Democrat lawfare. It's obviously election interference. And this Democrat Manhattan judge, as you said, Demo donated to President Biden yeah. and another anti-Trump cause, and his daughter has an illegal financial stake in this criminal prosecution. Extraordinary state of affairs. Um, what would happen if Trump was found guilty? 
Well, there's no question that with this biased, George Soros-funded prosecutor Alvin Bragg, Matthew Colangelo, this Democrat operative judge who has a clear bias, whose daughter has a big financial stake mm -hmm. in this criminal prosecution, with a jury pool that's 85% against Trump, there's no question he's going to be found guilty. Mike. It's going to get reversed on appeal, but maybe it's not before be the mess. election. It's going to be a mess. Mike, come back and see us for a longer period of time as this thing develops, please. Let's have a look at the weather with Ada McGiven first. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again, welcome to the latest weather forecast from the Met Office. It's going to stay blustery over the next 24 hours, but less windy than it has been, and the showers will slowly ease as well. Low pressure is pulling away, it's moving east. We've got high pressure arriving later in the week, but for the time being, the weather stays very changeable with showers or longer spells of rain moving through during the evening. Many of these showers will actually fade away after midnight, although some will continue down the North Sea coast there, one or two for Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and Central England, but otherwise plenty of drier and clearer weather emerging later in the night. A chill in the air first thing Tuesday, but too breezy for most for a frost. And there'll be plenty of bright weather first thing, especially for Scotland, Northern England, parts of Western UK. But further cloud and showers will affect the North Sea coast and showers will tend to bubble up elsewhere, particularly for Northern Ireland, parts of Central and Southern England, Wales and Northwest Scotland. It's going to stay on the cold side, but temperatures a degree or so higher compared with Mondays and less windy, so a bit more pleasant out there. Another chilly start on Wednesday, but again, plenty of sunshine first thing, turning cloudy and damp for Northern Ireland, showers emerging elsewhere, but plenty of bright or at least drier weather in between the showers. And then as we go through the latter half of the week, things do slowly turn drier, more settled and warmer. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Jacob Rees-Mogg is voting in the House of Commons in this game of parliamentary ping-pong over Rwanda. So the Farrar Show stays with you until 9 o'clock this evening. We'll talk more about the Iranian missile strikes on Israel, what Israel needs to do, and also, has it exposed the vulnerability of the Iranian regime? Plus, we've got Liz Truss on what happened to her, how she feels about the Bank of England, about the Treasury, her resignation, and, of course, that last famous photograph with the Queen. All of that comes in just a moment, but first, let's get the news with Polly Middlehurst. Nigel, thank you, and good evening to you. We start this bulletin with some breaking news coming to us from the United States. Uh, we can tell you that the armourer on the movie Rust has been sentenced to 18 months in prison over the death of the cinematographer Helena Hutchins. In 2021, Hannah Guterres-Reed mistakenly handed a loaded gun to actor Alec Baldwin on the film set, which resulted in Miss Hutchins being fatally shot as he pointed the gun at her. The jury took less than two hours to find Miss Gutierrez-Reed guilty of involuntary manslaughter. She was led away from court in silence, we understand, while her mother cried. Alec Baldwin, meanwhile, is charged with the same offence. His trial due to start in July. That news just into us. Well, in other news today, the Prime Minister is calling the Israeli leader this evening, appealing to him to show restraint following Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel. Earlier, Rishi Sunak told the Commons on the phone call he'll be reiterating the UK's solidarity with Israel, but also discussing how to prevent any further escalation of violence in the Middle East. And there was condemnation of Iran's military offensive against Israel from both Sakir Starmer and Rishi Sunak in the Commons today. Our aim is to support stability and security because it is right for the region and because, although the Middle East is thousands of miles away, it has a direct effect on our security and prosperity at home. There can be no doubt that the attack perpetrated by Iranian forces this weekend has left the world a more dangerous place. It targeted innocent civilians with a clear intent to destabilise the region. It must be wholly condemned by all. Sakir Starmer. Now, universal credit will need to change to meet the challenges of an older and a much sicker population, according to a new report. The report described how both the benefit system and the country have changed significantly since it was first introduced. It says the number of benefit claimants who are out of work due to ill health has almost doubled since 2013, reaching 2.3 million, while unemployment has fallen by almost 5% in the same period. The government recently announced changes to the credit scheme aimed at encouraging people with ill health to seek work. And lastly, the FBI has reportedly opened an investigation into the Baltimore Bridge collapse in the United States. Six people were killed when a cargo ship allegedly lost power and then veered off hitting the structure last month, bringing the entire bridge down like a, house, like a, like a pack of cards into the water below. The Washington Post says the federal criminal investigation will partly focus on whether or not the crew knew the vessel had serious problems with its systems before it left port. Work to clear the wreck and restore traffic through the busiest shipping channel in the eastern United States is ongoing. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com alerts.
Well, it was way back in 1979 when the revolution happened in Iran. The Shah was overthrown. And ever since that moment in time, Iran has been led by a really extreme Islamist ideology. It has become a country that treats its own people incredibly brutally. It has become a country that we know has funded its terrorist proxies all around the region. And last night, for the first time, it launched up to 350 missiles against the state of Israel. I think some good has come out of this. It's now pretty clear to everybody who the real bad guys are. It also shows militarily that Israel, with its allies, and in particular the Americans, and indeed the British Royal Air Force, were able to intercept and shoot down nearly all of the missiles. But in terms of what Israel should do next, and in terms of how this might play out with the Iranian public, and that is the thing that particularly interests me, I'm very, very pleased to be joined down the line from Washington, D.C., by Reza Pahlavi, the Crown Prince of Iran. Welcome to the programme. Thank you. Do you kind of get my point that if this was a really big push by Iran to cause maximum damage in Israel, it did actually fail, didn't it? Well, yes, and that's part of what the regime needed to do to prove to its base at home that they're doing something about uh, the elements of uh, the revolution guards that were taken out uh, recently. So basically, it's their way of responding to that, mostly for domestic consumption and prove that they've done something. But it's been entirely embarrassing, I would say, for a country that once had one of the most powerful non-nuclear armies to have so many billions of dollars wasted on this kind of uh, arsenal and, uh, as a result, not even have an effective uh, means of uh, doing anything. And Iranians who are, in the meantime, suffering at home, R Iranian women who are simultaneously brutalized in Iran, people queuing up for uh, gasoline and food, uh, our currency being devalued at 10,000 times uh, the value that it had before the revolution, in that economic situation are wondering why is all our country's resources wasted by, by this regime? The answer is simple. The regime never cared about the Iranian people. It only cares about exporting this ideology. And this is why it has, for the past four decades, been a menace to the region and the rest of the world. I was in the last hour having some quite passionate arguments, uh, one with the former British ambassador to Iran, who was a very strong supporter of the JCPOA agreement um, and uh, my own view and others, which is that, frankly, um, from Obama with Biden by his side to the European Union, who appear to be almost unrepentant today, that we have literally appeased Iran. What is your conclusion to this? Was it, was it the deal that Obama put forward with EU support and indeed British support, was it that that freed up the money for Iran to fund its proxies? Well, clearly, for this regime to have had more access to uh, funds that they would not have really obtained had, for instance, the old sanction being fully implemented, uh, the regime have, 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 has had at least an extra $100 billion worth of revenue that, of course, it spent on its proxy wars. Uh, it is not there for a coincidence. We see what the Houthis are doing, what Hamas did, and God knows what else will be done uh, down the line. When you, in fact, as a result of appeasement, incentivize the regime and empower them to do more, we shouldn't be surprised that it will have such adverse consequences. But I think we need yeah. to really think ultimately, what is the solution to the problem? Uh, I think the biggest weakness, and I've been arguing this for a long time now that the biggest flaw in terms of the foreign policy of Western governments vis-a-vis -vis this regime has been an expectation of behavior change. And this has been from the very beginning the, the wrong approach. Why? Because if you don't understand the DNA of this regime, if you don't understand that it, their values are completely the opposite of the free world in terms of human rights and democracy and liberty, that their sole objective is to impose regionally and beyond, a modern-day Shiite caliphate, which is why it justifies every uh, uh, steps that they have taken. That's what we are facing at the end of the day. And the only solution, ultimately, to the problem is for this regime to be no longer in place.
Yes, and that would need a counter-revolution. And every few years or so, we do see uh, street protests in Iran, uh, in Tehran and other parts of Iran, and we see an upwelling um, of people protesting against the brutalisation of society, protesting against the way women are treated, protesting about the sheer levels of poverty that they're living in. But it's very difficult for us to assess what the level of, dis of discontent within Iran with the regime actually is. Is there any accurate measure that we've got on that? Well, I think you can have much more ample evidence of where people are and how they think if there's a better usage of information available on social media. Iranians have been very uh, active in trying to send as many messages to the entire world to, to, to prove to the world exactly where they stand. We can hear, hear it in their demonstrations. We can hear it in, in what they post out there. We have citizen reporters every day talking about the malaise in Iran and the fact of how much disenchantment there is against the regime, but there's also an expectation from the outside world. Look, uh, let's not reinvent the wheel. Most movements that ultimately led to the liberation of countries uh, in recent history, look at the, the Solidarity Movement in Poland, look at what happened in South Africa, and many uh, similar examples. It could not have happened without the tacit support of the outside world. If we want to avoid confrontation, and if it's going to be done at the hands of the people of that country, in this case, Iran, then the only solution is empowerment. You have to give mm -hmm. them a fair chance to succeed. If they are completely helpless and abandoned under a very brutal regime, they cannot sustain this all by themselves forever. We need to be able, at some point, to have much more tacit support for the world. And the way that can happen is two things. One is to have a policy of increasing more pressure on the regime by means of sanctions. Perhaps it is time for the European countries to put the IRGC on the list of terrorist organizations, which yep. will bring more pressure on the regime. And parallel to that, have a policy of maximum support. In what way can they actually help the Iranian people have more means to be able to fight the fight at home? The combination of the external and domestic pressure should be enough to bring the regime down to its knees. But this is also not just a matter of regime change. We need to be able to have a peaceful transition to a future democracy. And that's where we need to all be very coordinated, Iranians among themselves and the free worlds, if indeed they believe that that's a much better course of action to put an end to this regime, meaning all the problems that the world has been facing, and instead have a country that is now an element contributing to regional peace, stability and cooperation. Well, Crown Prince Reza, I personally would love to see that. I think most of us who love freedom and democracy and peace would love to see that as well. And thank you very much indeed for joining me tonight here Thanks on Thanks for GB having News. me. Appreciate it. Yeah, and it's... It, very interesting, isn't it? You know, clearly, clearly, there are a lot of people living in Iran, highly dissatisfied with living under this extremist regime, and yet every time they try and protest, of course, they are brutally put down. In a moment, it's back to the House of Commons. Let's see how Sir Jacob and others are getting on. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. It's a remarkable story, isn't it? Amazing. Extraordinary. And also, she was unflappable, apparently, yeah. the Princess Royal. She's just brilliant. refused to get out of the car and said, I'm not going anywhere. Extraordinary. Well, Jim Beaton was awarded the George Cross for protecting the princess and delighted to say, joins us now, along with the former head of Royal Royalty Protection, Di Davis. Jim, you won't remember, but I met you some time ago at the Imperial War Museum when Princess Anne was opening an exhibition to do with the George Cross and you were there reunited with her, um, and you told me then what great admiration you had for the princess, cool under fire, but you didn't do so badly yourself. It was probably my job, and also um, I had a wee bit of police training, not very much, but a little bit, uh, whereas uh, Princess Anne had nothing, and yet the way she displayed it, you would have thought she'd been uh, highly trained to... Um, deal with any type of that situation. Even though you'd had some training, you took three bullets for the princess. You effectively stood between her and a deranged gunman. Well, I was supposed to be a protection officer, really, so um, I just tried to 
fuddle about. You must remember that back in 1974, there was no communication, and we were extremely lucky that Michael Hills, who was outside Clarence House and nearby, had got one of the fast police radios, um, or radios on his shoulder, so he was able to send a message out. Otherwise, we would have just been relying in the good old public to phone in and say there's something happening. Yeah, so been... times have changed drastically. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Let's go back to the Palace of Westminster and join Christopher Hope, GB News's political editor, who I understand has a guest with him that is well known on this hour at GB News. Nigel, that's right. And joining me in Westminster Hall is Jacob Rees Mogg. Uh, Jacob, a colleague from GB News, of course. Nigel Farage asked me a question like he always does. I didn't have an answer for him. Uh, he said, What happens on Wednesday? if the peers don't roll over, as the whips expect, and accept the, that they're not going to get these changes through to the Rwanda bill? Before I answer that, can I just thank Nigel for standing in for me? Apologise to my viewers for not being on parade, but I'm here to vote <laughs> in support of the Rwanda bill and push it back to the House of Lords. Um, if neither House can come to an agreement, then eventually the bill stops. But that has to be a decision of the Houses. There are conventions, but there's no fixed rule. So if either House think it's worth having another go, we can keep on going until doomsday. The Salisbury Convention doesn't kick in because that's a second reading, so it simply it keeps going. At some point, if there's, if there's no, no movement, you have to pause all, all collapses and we have a year's wait by which time there's an action. Well, I imagine the Lords will give in. They usually do. It's extremely rare for the Lords to Ooh, insist you know. on their view on a matter of policy. They sometimes um, insist on a constitutional matter, so um, length of time people may be held without trial mm. and things like that. But it's very retrospective legislation. But it'd be very rare for them to do it on a matter of policy. I would expect them to give way. They have no democratic mandate to do this. The Lords is meant to be a revising chamber. Michael Tomlinson, the illegal migration minister, he says the reason why the government's opposing these six amendments and offering a solution on the seventh is because they don't want lawyers to get their claws into this bill and, and this act when it becomes an act and stopping the flights taking off. Is that right? Oh, the amendments are wrecking amendments. They're quite outrageous that they're an attempt to stop the democratic will of the British people in getting the boats ended. And the House of Lords, who are um, lefty lawyers loving Brussels, I can't think of an L for Brussels, um, tied into the European Convention on Human Rights, which is bonkers and is now telling governments they've got to be more green and interfering in the minutiae of policies. That's what we've got in the House of Lords. It's a lot of Labour members, only a small number comparatively of Conservative members, a lot of crossbenchers who are infected by the lefty wokery of, um, uh, of the quangocracy, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and they're obstructing the will of the British people. I wasn't asking for a mogologue, but I got one. Uh, no, but my, my point, yeah, I mean, of course the peers would say, well, that's not very fair, Jacob, we're trying to make this uh, better and more in line with international law and, and make sure that, that the UK isn't, isn't sort of thumbing its nose at international conventions. But highest law in this country is an act of parliament. That's our basis, basis of our constitution. If the Lords don't understand that, they should retire from the House of Lords. It is an act of parliament that will come through this. That is the final word on law in the UK. And international law has a very dubious status and in lots of cases doesn't have a court which adjudicates on it. And even if it does, isn't binding within the UK. 
Well, Nigel, well, Nigel you heard it there from uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg making very clear there that, um, that uh, it this could go on and on and on, although the whip's expected to be over by Wednesday. Do you have a question for Jacob? I can give it off to him. Yeah, I, I just... I, I, Jacob seems very confident uh, that the Lords will back down, and yet there's some quite senior peers saying that they won't back down, and they see a relatively weak Conservative government coming towards the end of its days. Um, I, I just think the chances of obstruction are higher than Jacob thinks. Yeah. Nigel's there saying he thinks that, that the chance of obstruction are higher than you think. The Tory government, Nigel says, is towards the end of its days. Senior peers are saying it's not going to work. How are certain, how, why are you so certain this will go through by Wednesday night? I'm not absolutely certain. I think it's what the Lords should do. It would be in accordance with the constitutional norms. Um, Lord Anderson of Ipswich has said very clearly, and he's a very distinguished, sensible peer, uh, that it's right for the Lords to ask the Commons to think again, but it's not right for the Lords to insist. The Archbishop of Canterbury has said much the same. He will accept the will of the elected House. I think for other elderly peers to block the elected will of the British people raises questions over the whole validity of the House of Lords, which is so out of touch uh, with, with the nation. And you begin to talk about whether you should create peers um, to get them to push this through. So this far but no further, you think the peers will say? Well, I hope so. But I, I didn't hear what Nigel said, but he's very wise, and so I'd probably agree with it if I'd heard it. Well, Nigel, you heard uh, the answer there from Jacob rees yeah, He thinks you. it's not going it's not going to be a problem. We'll wait and see. No. OK, well, I'm joined by Fadi Farhat, Senior Legal Consultant at Gulbenkian and Donian Solicitors. And, and Fadi, we've sort of covered the House of Lords thing. We'll see. I mean, we don't know, do we? We don't. Um, we're in unprecedented, uncharted yeah. territory. Um, this legislation is one that goes to very key and core issues in relation to our constitution, Ooh. the rule of law, Ooh. the separation of powers. Um, and we're in uncharted territory, no, really so are. how the Lords will react to this, given that they've tabled ten amendments initially and then seven amendments later on, and these are quite key amendments referencing international law, um, so it just really depends on their appetite um, on Wednesday and no, what will happen. Be, yeah, I, 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 I don't quite share. It was interesting, when I went back to Jacob a second time, he said that's what they should do. Yes. As opposed to, he was rather more certain in his answer the first time. Fadi, even if this goes through, let's say it's all done and dusted, it gets the royal assent, it becomes an act. Already we have Care for Calais and a whole variety of groups lining up to say they're going to mount legal challenges. I mean, it's very good news for your industry, this, isn't it? Yes, I mean, the legal challenges are... Effectively, the Supreme Court Part 2, it's, 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 it's based on the idea that this legislation is quite unique. It's legislation where Parliament is making a factual determination about a third country on the ground. Parliament is saying this yeah. country is safe. Mm -hmm. Parliament's entitled to do that. Um, but the idea is that Parliament is making a factual determination and the legal challenge will be rooted in the point that any factual determination should be challenged in the courts. And I gave the example to Jacob last time, which is if Parliament tomorrow passes an act of Parliament called the Weather Act, mm -hmm. and in it, Section 1 says, every day is a sunny day, mm -hmm. that's fine. But whether factually every day will be a sunny day is a different issue, and that's the point here, is that Parliament is saying Rwanda is a safe third country. It's entitled to do that, but should things change on the ground or should new evidence emerge, the legal challenge is that that should be determined by the courts if there's a change on the ground. Parliament yeah. says no, and this is where we're heading towards a collision course, and that's the key issues that are changed. Oh, I think we are heading towards a collision yeah. course. There's little doubt about that. And, and Lord and Hoffman in, in, the, in the House of Lords last time said the last time something of this sort happened, you have to go back to 1531, where Parliament said that we're putting forward a factual determination as to something. Mm. So we're, we're saying we're in uncharted territory yeah, is, 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 an, is, is an understatement. What I think is going to come out of all of this is that the ECHR will become a bigger and bigger political issue. A little bit like Brexit. Do we stay, do we leave? I think the judgment on green issues awarded to those Swiss women the other day ups the ante on this debate significantly. Do you think leaving ECHR could become a serious political issue? It could, and um, you, you hear it more... Because I believe in it, you know, I, mean, I believe in leaving. I don't personally, but all I would say is that even on the issue of leaving, there's a process for leaving, yep. and in effect, there's a six-month notice period. 
something that's very rarely talked about. So, a sort of Article 50 for the ECHR. Indeed, indeed. That's enshrined in the Convention itself. Yeah. So, there is a, a notice period, as it were. And from memory, I, I believe, I'm, I'm fairly certain it's six months. So, <clears throat> even if you were to activate that, how does this tie in with the general election and how this ties in with effectively time running out for this present government, yes. as the polls suggest? So when do you activate the, 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 the notice to leave the ECHR? Then you kickstart a six-month notice period. The longer you leave it, the more you're eating up into the election period. And yeah. it looks like it will never happen just on that sort of timing. On it feels time. like it's, it's going to be... It feels to me right now this is going to be a general election issue. Uh, whichever way people vote, whether it actually happens or how long it takes to happen is another thing. But it, I mean, it is doable, isn't it? If, if we chose to leave it, we could leave it. As you say, it's all clearly it's all clearly set out. We'd receive a whole load of abuse from our European partners, uh, from those in this country that hated Brexit in the first place. But it is legally doable. It, it's legally doable um, in terms of the legal framework. Yeah. Um, but as with everything. Uh, any legal pathways are dependent on political will. Yeah, and we've got the devolution agreements with it written into, and we've got the Brexit agreement. It would be one hell of a job. But it's coming. Fardy, thank you for joining me. In a moment, we're going to get Liz Truss unfiltered on the Bank of England, the Treasury, and those that brought her down. Hello again, welcome to the latest weather forecast from the Met Office. It's going to stay blustery over the next 24 hours, but less windy than it has been, and the showers will slowly ease as well. Low pressure is pulling away, it's moving east. We've got high pressure arriving later in the week, but for the time being, the weather stays very changeable with showers or longer spells of rain moving through during the evening. Many of these showers will actually fade away after midnight, although some will continue down the North Sea coast there. One or two for Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and Central England, but otherwise plenty of drier and clearer weather emerging later in the night. A chill in the air first thing Tuesday, but too breezy for most for a frost. And there'll be plenty of bright weather first thing, especially for Scotland, Northern England, parts of Western UK. But further cloud and showers will affect the North Sea coast and showers will tend to bubble up elsewhere, particularly for Northern Ireland, parts of central and southern England, Wales and northwest Scotland. It's going to stay on the cold side, but temperatures a degree or so higher compared with Mondays and less windy, so a bit more pleasant out there. Another chilly start on Wednesday, but again, plenty of sunshine first thing, turning cloudy and damp for Northern Ireland, showers emerging elsewhere, but plenty of bright or at least drier weather in between the showers. And then as we go through the latter half of the week, things do slowly turn drier, more settled and warmer. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Well, she may only have been Prime Minister for 49 days, but goodness me. Think of that first image. The 6th of September, 2022, she flies to Balmoral, the picture of her shaking hands 
with the Queen. That is the last photograph taken of Her Majesty the Queen when she was still alive. Two days later, there's Truss, the new PM, and the Queen has died. We then, of course, had the budget, not long after the big state funeral, a budget that was dramatic, the reaction to it from the Bank of England, the International Monetary Fund, Joe Biden and many others led ultimately to her resignation after a run on the markets. In this next quarter of an hour, I talk to Liz Truss about all of those things. Contest reasonably comfortably, quite a big margin over Rishi Sunak. And then this completely astonishing and historic turn of events, which you document that the Queen is up at Balmoral and Boris Johnson goes to Balmoral to say goodbye. You turn up at Balmoral, you meet the Queen, and it is, I believe, the last ever photograph of the Queen, and that was on the 6th of September. I remember, I remember seeing the photograph, thinking that she did look very, very weak, mm. very, very weak indeed, but I still, two days later, simply couldn't believe when we heard the news that she'd gone, it seemed that she'd never, ever go. She gave you some advice, didn't she? She did give me some advice. What did she say? She told me to pace myself. Very sensible advice. Did you listen to her? Uh, maybe not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think many would say she was very... Maybe she said... Because she was very, very knowledgeable politically, far more, I think, than most of the British public understood. Perhaps she could see that you were in a hurry. Perhaps she could. Perhaps she could. She was very, um, I mean, she was incredibly lucid at that meeting, yeah. incredibly across what was happening in Britain. Uh, she's a, she was a great person. Yeah. And, you know, it was a, it was a very sad loss you know, oh. for the nation, but also, frankly, for me personally. Uh, and you know, she finished our meeting by saying, I'll see you again next week. Yeah. And I thought, Do you, you know, would? she would be there and she yeah. wasn't. And there we are, two days later, it's the 8th of September 2022, and the official announcement comes yep. late in the afternoon that the Queen's gone. Um, and you've got this situation where Charles, you know, he's waited forever for this job, but his mother's just died. That can't be very easy at all. And you've literally been Prime Minister for a few hours. <laughs> And the most famous person in the world, and the head of the Commonwealth and the queen of our country has gone. You do sort of almost admit in the book that it was a bit overwhelming. Yeah, it was. It was. And the... I mean, by that stage, I was just in, you know, performance and survival mode. So, yeah. I mean, the, the leadership election had kicked off while I was in Indonesia. Uh, I watched Boris resign from a hotel screen in Bali of all places, uh -huh. and I had to sort of rush back. And then from then on, you know, it was just, you know, it was building the car as we were driving along on the road on the leadership contest, you know, filming videos, doing events, doing mm. announcements, you know, getting ready when it looked like I was going to win, getting ready for government, doing all that preparation, and then straight in mm. with all the things like appointing the cabinet, making the speeches. So in that circumstance, there was a... There was a moment which was a few days after the Queen had died and I was sitting on the sofa with my daughter, I just burst into tears because it was all so overwhelming. I'm sure it was. But... Yes, you had all those things to do and yet this, this story, the Queen's death, the, the lying in state, the extraordinary uh, funeral, which was, amazing. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. The, cr the crowds that gathered in Hyde Park and at Windsor, it was quite... Quite astonishing. And that photograph, as I say, of you with her, the last photograph ever recorded of the Queen. Things move incredibly quickly, Liz, don't they? Because, I mean... <laughs> you know, do. You know, we're 6th of September, we're 8th of September. I can't got... believe... When I look back, I just can't believe it all happened yeah. so quickly and so much was fitted into well, it did every because, 24 hours. Because suddenly it's budget. And we're still... We're still actually not out of the third week of September. It's the 23rd of September. It's the budget being delivered by Kwasi Kwarteng. And I've got to tell you, you know, as somebody that believes in small state and free enterprise, it was the first budget I'd listened to since, I think, Nigel Lawson 
when I was in a city trading room, that I thought, wow, this really is going uh, to, 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 to sort of cause um, a huge debate and some real change. Um, I, I must admit, I had mild caution that maybe on the tax cuts it was too much too soon, but it seemed to me, it seemed to me this was a genuine attempt to turn things around and stimulate growth. When you, I mean, it's difficult, obviously, given given where you went with it all. I guess the biggest failure of the lot, if I look at it and get your point of view, but you were open to the charge of unfunded tax cuts without any corresponding cuts in government spending. Are they fair criticisms? Because that's what everybody thought and saw. Well, this, this idea of an unfunded tax cut yeah. is a left-wing idea. Mm. Nobody ever talks about unfunded spending. You know, we'd had several furlough announcements, which were much bigger than what we announced in the mini budget, yeah. which had gone on notice. They'd gone unmonitored by the Office of Budget Responsibility. But, and this is what I mean about the ideological bent of these institutions yeah. and organisations. But the problem was we had organisations, including the Treasury, including the OBR, including the Bank of England, that basically didn't support the policy. So, of course, they were briefing out stuff about... Well, it wasn't know, just them. The International Monetary Fund in Washington was very critical of the budget. I yeah, mean, there was but, this but feeling... You've got to... Why, what was the IMF's criticism? The IMF's criticism wasn't that it was economically bad. Their criticism was it was unfair. Yeah. I'm sorry, what yeah. business yeah, yeah, yeah. is it of theirs yeah, the tax whether cuts. or not yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> British and, and, tax... And, that's and, a domestic and, policy. And, I can't believe House. you're quoting them, to be honest. No, but, no, no, no. no. Uh... Listen, I'm not saying I agreed with them, but it was... As an observer, I could see that the opposition... There was a pile-on, was, was not, no. not just from the left in Britain, and by the left I include quite a lot of the financial yeah. media, but also from the US, yeah. from others, because they don't want their economic model to be challenged. Yeah. You know, and, 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 unfortunately... And your own backbenchers, a lot of them were very wobbly. Well, that's true. And some of them actively opposed the policies. Yeah. And it, I, I kind of thought about this when I ran for leadership. I thought, am I going to actually be able to deliver these policies? You know, is there enough support for them? And I thought... We had to... What was the alternative? The alternative was doing nothing and not getting the economic growth and the economic opportunities that were so important for putting the country on the right track. So I was, I was conscious of that. I did hope that my colleagues would give me a chance yeah. and support me in the first instance, and, frankly, there wasn't enough of that. No. Um, but... But that's politics. But the, the, the part of this book that I think is the most interesting. And, you know, you're going to be called a conspiracy theorist and many other things, but it is the role of the Bank of England, not just after the budget, but before the budget. Did the bank know what was coming in the budget? Yes. They did? Of course they did. Yeah. Well, first of all, I spent the whole summer in the leadership contest talking about all the major measures and saying there would be an urgent, you know, an urgent fiscal event to announce these measures. So the corporation tax cut, which was or not, not rising, no. yeah. that was the thing I talked that, about. That was well documented. And that was the yeah. thing that I was forced to reverse. Yeah. That is the thing that I was forced to re reverse, essentially by the economic establishment. And of course they knew about it. And the Bank of England, the Bank of England in regular touch with Treasury officials, we had worked up the entire mini budget with Treasury officials prior to me getting into number 10. Mm. So they all knew about it. The Bank of England were cited on it. And yet, ahead of the budget, interest rates need to rise to curb inflation. They don't rise as much as everybody expects them to do. That makes sterling a little bit, little bit weaker on the exchanges. And then this extraordinary measure where the Bank of England sell British government bonds, better known as gilts, did they try to, do you believe in your own mind, that the bank tried and helped to engineer a run on the markets? What I think and you know, is for the Bank of England to answer what happened over those days is they certainly didn't work to support the government's fiscal policy with their monetary policy. Mm. 
And we know that that is the successful way to approach economic policy is that fiscal and monetary policy have to work together. And they certainly didn't work to support that, and nor did they alert uh, Quasi or I to the real risks in the market of the LDI issue. Liz, you finish up very much on the back foot, embattled. Uh, you have to, you know, U-turn on one of the key flagship policies, Quasi goes. Uh, those last few days must have been very, very difficult indeed. I mean, so immediately after the whole LDI issue becomes apparent. Mm. This is when the governor of the Bank of England intervenes. But he intervenes to create a, only for a certain period of time, 17 days. So what that effectively does is create a cliff edge, which means mm. rather than sorting out the problem, it's creating speculation about what the government did. And at that time, there was also a lot of briefing coming out of the Bank of England, essentially blaming the mini budget for what was actually happening in the LDI market. Mm. And so not only had we not been alerted to this LDI issue, we were actually being blamed for the consequences. So there was blame shifting going on from the Bank of England and the authorities onto the government over an issue we had no control over, no sight over. And we were just, we were not prepared to respond to that. I mean. When, when I got into number 10, you know, we'd had a fairly new team recruited. It, people weren't necessarily experienced in these issues. And what happened is the economic establishment did use that to be able to lay the blame at our door. Well, they got their way. In the end, you had to resign. Uh, and it must, the whole thing must have been, the whole thing on a personal level must have been horrific. Well, it was in those types of circumstances, you know, my absolute focus was making sure that you know, we didn't end up in some kind of guilt crisis. Mm. You know, I, I didn't want to let the country down. So even though I was very angry with the Bank of England about what they'd done and the way that they were behaving, mm. even though I was very angry with the Office of Budget Responsibility, who had essentially leaked the fact that there was a £70 billion hole in the budget, that leak, that leak turned out not to be true, but, but that spooked the markets as well. <laughs> so I had active leaking and briefing going on. If I had responded and said that, if I'd responded and criticised the governor of the Bank of England or gone on the record and criticised the OBR, I feared that would create more difficulties in the markets. And what I didn't want was to be in a situation where Britain was not able to fund its debt. So I had to take it, basically. And that was beyond frustrating because I, I still believe, and many economists agree with me, from Art Laffer to Patrick Minford mm. to Doug McWilliams, you know, I still believe my plans were the right plans. But yes. I just faced a huge, <clears throat> huge hostility in seeking to implement them. Well, it's all very powerful stuff. I have to say, I do believe that what she was trying to do with Kwasi Kwarteng in that budget was correct. They were the right things, many of them common sense, sensible things to do. I was particularly pleased to hear, you know, IR35 rules, which are making life so difficult for the self-employed, would be reviewed. But she was fighting Treasury orthodoxy. She was fighting this Office of Budget Responsibility, and clearly, the biggest fight of all was with the Bank of England. And when you think, you add to that, the International Monetary Fund were weighing in, saying it was wrong to cut taxes for high earners. Joe Biden piled in before she resigned. I have some sympathy for her. I feel, had they actually cut spending in that budget, they might have got away with it. But probably the conclusion is, they tried to do too much too soon. Either way, we're now back to Jeremy Hunt, and it almost makes no difference now, economically, I think, whether Labour or the Conservatives win the next election. I have some sympathy with Truss. I believe the Bank of England behaved appallingly. In a moment, I'll discuss that with City grandee Daniel Hodson and see whether he agrees with my analysis. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
the perception of a crime being committed um, is not based on whether that person intended to commit a crime or not, but whether the victim, in inverted commas, uh, or anybody else for that matter who happened to hear whatever was said, uh, determines that um, it was motivated by malice or ill will. Most of these things come out in, in heated exchanges or in, you know, very casual exchanges. Mm. Uh, and then somebody says, oh, I'm offended or I'm hurt or I'm whatever because this was clearly uh, malicious and it's against me as a, uh, a, a black person um, or a, a transgender uh, or sexual uh, sexuality, whatever it might be. And somebody says, I perceive this to be uh, motivated by hate. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point, th what is the reasonable test um, that anybody could apply as to what was in somebody's mind at the time? You don't know what I'm thinking now. I don't know what you're thinking now. Why is it that a crime can be committed on the basis of what somebody is alleged to be thinking? Well, that's also how discrimination often works, because people have worked out these days that saying something or sending an email like what I received some years ago that said, let's go round her place with pickaxe handles and balaclavas and see what we can do. Now, that's an email that was sent about me. People have worked out that you don't do that. But from the circumstance of what happens, if racial taunts were being shouted, if taunts about someone's protective, protected characteristic were being shouted in the run-up to what then happened, it would be pretty obvious that that was a hate crime. But we know, for example, that street preachers have been arrested uh, merely for quoting the Bible um, and without actually intending you know, an anything beyond that. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I asked you earlier, how did the West get it so wrong over Iran? One or two of your reactions coming in that are interesting. Alan says, we must decide whether or not it's in our interest to get rid of the Iranian regime. If it is, and I think it is in our interest to get rid of it, then we should no messing around. Steve makes a very, very powerful point indeed. He says, I believe Israel and the rest should deal with Iran immediately swiftly and forcefully before they become a nuclear power. Forget Russia or China, it's Iran that will start World War III. And Steve, I have to say, I do have some sympathy with that view. And Matt says, isn't it ironic that Cameron, one of the key idiots in the destruction of Libya, is now preaching to Israel as to whether it has a legitimate reason to carry out military operations? Matt, Cameron was wrong about Iran, wrong about Libya, wrong about the European Union, wrong about China. And for Sunak to have brought him back as Foreign Secretary is a disaster. Now, joining me down the line is City Grandee Daniel Hodson to help me respond to what Liz Truss had to say. Daniel, welcome to the programme. I can't help thinking that from the IMF to the OBR, the Treasury, to everybody, Bank of England, it's almost as if there was a globalist agenda that said, do not cut the size of government and do not cut taxes. Well, I think that you have to look at some of the things Liz said. It was very clear that she had obviously had some conversations before she came, became PM. But I think it's all about markets here. It's all about understanding markets. And what actually fundamentally went wrong at the time of execution was I believe the Bank of England didn't actually understand 
the market to the extent it should. Now, markets are hugely powerful, and the whole events surrounding that uh, the, the debacle following the budget prove that. She referred to these liability-driven investments, very complicated instruments. I wonder whether the bank properly understood what the impact would be if she did the sort of things she proposed to do in the budget. But I also think that uh, the words that she repeated at the Queen's, which I think you yourself would agree with, Nigel, uh, I, think, I think you did, pace yourself probably would have yeah. applied. And don't yes. forget, the economic background was extremely poor. I mean, inflation was 9% and rising. Interest rates were very low. It was clear they were going to have to go up. So, I mean, the whole circumstance was there. But I go back to my original point. I actually believe in the independence of the Bank of England, but I think the Bank of England needs to be, in a way, far more market-oriented. It should be. It always was. When I ran a city market, I used to spend a lot of time in the Bank of England talking about what the markets were wow. doing. They should have known that these LDIs were going to do what they did, and they clearly did not. You see, my point is, when I worked in the city, a different institution to you, we used to go and play golf for the Bank of England. They had social yeah. connections through all the yeah. markets. They were in charge yeah. of regulating the banks. They've been running the banks and the banking industry since 1694. And Gordon yes. Brown took all of that away, put regulation of a city to a bunch of tick box bureaucrats down in Canary Wharf. And actually, far from being independent, I think what Liz Truss is saying, that by selling government bonds on the eve of the budget, that the Bank of England acted politically. I'm not sure that's true, actually. I, I mean, I do believe in a complementarity between the management of the fiscal side of, of policy and, and the monetary side. I believe in the, in the Bank of England's independence. Uh, I, but I think that it could be better structured, better managed. It did get some of the regulation back again, of course. Uh, and the, the whole problem is one which actually is, is one with which you can identify the whole of regulation these days, which is that it isn't market sensitive enough and markets mm. are very powerful. And what happened, and, and global markets are very powerful. I, I would ignore, with the exception of probably the Office of Budget Responsibility, the external comments on it, because I think we have every right to go ahead and plan our own economy as we want. And, and so many times those external experts have been proved wrong, as indeed the Office of Budget Responsibility has been proved wrong. So that is itself one of the problems here. I think it's a problem not with the structure or the basis of the institution, but the way it's actually run. Now, pace yourself, as you say. The Queen's advice was very, very good advice. She was incredibly wise right up to her last couple of days. And clearly, you know, Truss uh, did not pace herself. She went sort of going for gold with that budget too much too soon, and I would agree with you on that analysis. But here's the point. She was trying to argue for free markets. She was trying to argue for entrepreneurship and the encouragement of people who were self-employed running small businesses. She was arguing that the tax burden has become too high and people have started leaving the country, whereas we'd rather have them here paying their taxes with us. Those arguments about lower taxes, about a smaller state, about entrepreneurship, I wonder, as a result of what happened during that 49 days, whether that debate has possibly been put back from the national stage for several years. Well, of course, it depends entirely on what you think is going to happen towards the end of this year with, with the change of government. Uh, I sort of doubt, based, based on what uh, the Shadow Chancellor is saying, that they're going to change much from the Hunt uh, 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 programme. Uh, it reminds me of what used to be called butskalism in the old yeah. days. That, that was the uh, but Butler and Gate School, the two chancellors and the shadow chancellor. And I'm afraid that's right. But I do think one thing, which, which I'm sure you'd agree with, Nigel, is that the most important things that she was doing in the budget, leaving aside your point about spending, and I think you could say that maybe there, it was a bit excessive on that, on, that, on, on that side, but the Laffer curve to which she referred in her interview which shows, mm. and has been proven again and again and again, shows that if you raise the marginal tax, higher taxes, you get more tax income. Yeah. If, you, yeah. if, you, if, you, if you, sorry, if you lower the, the tax rate at the higher end, you get, yeah. you get, uh, get more income. And I more think revenue. she was yeah. 
a right about that, as she was indeed about corporate taxes too. But you know, unfortunately, as you rightly say, it won't be it won't be tried out now. I think that no. um, the difficulty that was Daniel, that she, the and that Daniel, I think is that. That, Daniel, I think is the tragedy. I'm going to have to leave it there. Thank you as ever for coming on. Uh, in this case, on Jacob's show, really not mine. Uh, now, Patrick Christie's is coming up. Patrick, what is on the menu for this evening, please? Uh, I have got the worst ever example of an asylum detention centre popping up. It's got everything wrong with it. It's a big exclusive. I went to visit it on Saturday, so we'll be dealing with that. Uh, former Armed Forces Minister James Heapy is live on this show as well. Are we ready for war? How far should we go when it comes to supporting Israel? An Iranian terror sleeper cells operating in Britain, Nigel, with visas funded by the taxpayer. It's all going to be very powerful stuff. I'll join you live from Brussels. Return to Brussels tomorrow night at 7. First, let's have a look at the all-important weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again, welcome to the latest weather forecast from the Met Office. It's going to stay blustery over the next 24 hours, but less windy than it has been, and the showers will slowly ease as well. Low pressure is pulling away, it's moving east. We've got high pressure arriving later in the week, but for the time being, the weather stays very changeable with showers or longer spells of rain moving through during the evening. Many of these showers will actually fade away after midnight, although some will continue down the North Sea coast there, one or two for Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and central England, but otherwise plenty of drier and clearer weather emerging later in the night. A chill in the air first thing Tuesday, but too breezy for most for a frost. And there'll be plenty of bright weather first thing, especially for Scotland, Northern England, parts of western UK. But further cloud and showers will affect the North Sea coast and showers will tend to bubble up elsewhere, particularly for Northern Ireland, parts of central and southern England, Wales and northwest Scotland. It's going to stay on the cold side, but temperatures a degree or so higher compared with Mondays and less windy, so a bit more pleasant out there. Another chilly start on Wednesday, but again, plenty of sunshine first thing, turning cloudy and damp for Northern Ireland, showers emerging elsewhere, but plenty of bright or at least drier weather in between the showers. And then as we go through the latter half of the week, things do slowly turn drier, more settled and warmer. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only 